So I'm sure most of you saw the John Angelos um, situation on Monday at Camden Yards. So let's try to answer, is John Angelos serious? Getting that question and more on today's mailbag episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast. You are Locked On Orioles, your daily Baltimore Orioles podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, Orioles fans. Today is Wednesday, January 18th, 2023. And welcome back in to the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, I'm your host, Connor Newcomb. And coming up on today's episode, we are opening up the mailbag once again here on the pod here on a Wednesday. I've got seven Orioles questions from you, the listeners, to get to here on today's episode. We usually do nine on a mailbag episode, but the reason I've cut it to seven today is because I wanted to give a little more time to one question having to do with what the heck John Angelos said on Monday. But we will also talk about some long-term contracts in Major League Baseball, Anthony Santander's upcoming season for the Orioles. We'll talk about how the shift will impact the O's, some additions to Camden Yards, and more coming up on a mailbag episode of the Locked on Orioles podcast. So let's just jump right in. And the first question on today's mailbag is the one that I wanted to spend the most time on. And this question I'm sure has come from many of you. You've at least thought this, but specifically, I submitted myself a mailbag question. So this question comes from Connor Nuka, who asks, is John Angelo serious? If you didn't see or hear or read about what transpired in the warehouse at Oriole Park on Monday, here is the Cliff Notes version. John Angelos and Baltimore Mayor Brandon Scott held a kind of really a meeting slash press conference on Monday morning in the warehouse to announce the Orioles $5 million donation to the College Bound Foundation, which is a great organization that's been around, I believe, since the 80s in Baltimore uh, that helps students in the city acquire scholarship money to go to college. And it's been a great resource for many students in the city for years. And it was, I believe, the biggest donation they've had, $5 million from the Orioles, the foundation said that $5 million is right around their operating budget per year. Angelo's just doubled it with that donation, and it was a cool moment. And you can obviously see why they scheduled it for Martin Luther King Day on Monday to announce this scholarship. And, you know, Brandon Scott talked about the money and the city's relationship with the Orioles. Now, the O's were asked about, hey, you know, is there going to be a Q&A after this? The O's said yes. So not only the local Baltimore media, but the people that cover the Orioles came to this press conference as well, prepared with questions. And Angelos got a couple of questions. And the first one, rightfully so, had to do with the lease at Camden Yards, which expires on December 31st of 2023 at the end of this year. And the deadline is just two weeks away to sign the one-time five-year lease extension. The Orioles can exercise a five-year extension if they sign it by February 1st of 2023. They can tack on five years and make the lease run through 2028. Seems like a pretty easy decision at this point, but the O's haven't done it and we're two weeks out. So he gets a question about that and he responds saying, I get you know, why you're asking the question, but he says, you know, respectfully, I'm not going to talk about that on Martin Luther King Day. It's not what Dr. King would have wanted. So you're already thinking... You scheduled this event in the warehouse of the baseball team that you own. You've only been available. It's only the second time you've been available to the media in four years as the face of the Orioles Angelos family ownership group. That is John Angelos. Did you not expect to get Orioles questions? And I got to say, although the question wasn't directly about this donation or college bound, Asking if the Orioles are planning on staying in Baltimore does relate to the fact that John Angelos and Brandon Scott were there together talking about the Orioles' relationship with the city in general. I think it was a fair question to ask and an appropriate question to ask. What wasn't appropriate is 
John Angelo is saying, I'm not going to answer that question because it's not what Dr. King would have wanted. But whatever, he passes over, and next it goes to Dan Connolly of The Athletic. As many of my listeners know, I've been critical of Dan Connolly in the past. I don't think he covers the team as well as he should, especially writing for a place like The Athletic that is behind a paywall. He clearly has some vendettas against the Orioles from his past when he worked for the Baltimore Sun. It shows up in a lot of his writing. I don't think a lot of it's fair. And in my limited interactions with him, some have not been pleasant. And I've heard similar things from other people. However, in this case, I didn't think Dan Connolly was out of line because he follows up that question, gets the microphone, and he asks about the Angelos family as a whole and how the ownership group will proceed moving forward, how it could affect the Orioles. And he also asks Mayor Scott the same kind of question. Basically, are you worried about these kind of donations, this relationship with the city, if a new ownership group does come in? Which is a fair question because, as we know, the entire Angelos family for six plus months has been involved in an interfamily lawsuit, trying to figure out who seizes control of the law firm, of the Orioles, of the family's assets, especially when Peter Angelos, who has been in bad health for a while, does pass away. And those are all fair questions because not only does it relate to this press conference, because the Orioles' relationship with the city could change if ownership changes, and it looks like because of the lawsuit, it's trending that way. And when you haven't made yourself available to the public, when this is the first time John Angelos has basically shown his face in public since the details of the lawsuit came out, do you expect to not get a question about it? And again, two times in four years you've been made available, you're going to get those questions. You can't be that stupid to think you're not going to get those questions. And he basically goes on an entire rant at Dan Connolly instead of talking about hey, I'm not going to answer those questions today. This is about our donation and the college bound fund slips to the next question. That would have been annoying, but it would have been fine and wouldn't have got the reaction. Instead, kind of tirades Dan Connolly, gives him a lecture, asks him if he's from here. One thing Dan Connolly is not guilty of is being from somewhere else. I mean, the dude has grown up in the Baltimore area and lived here and worked here basically his entire career, covered the Orioles for a long, long time. It... And then, you know, invokes it being MLK Day, invokes Dr. Martin Luther King multiple times in this lecture he basically gave about why it's not appropriate to ask about the Orioles. And yet he's the owner of the Orioles. He is making his first public appearance since all of this went down with this lawsuit. And all these questions are swirling about the future ownership of the team. They are fair questions. And he tries to say it's not fair because it's MLK Day. You scheduled this press conference on MLK Day. You had to know you were going to get Orioles questions. You can't be that stupid. And it's either stupidity or it's just the billionaire mindset that he has of just, I can do no wrong and no one can touch me, which plenty of billionaires have, which is one of the many problems that exist with billionaires just existing in our society. And the fact that he felt so privileged to just say, oh, I don't have to talk about anything because it's Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Like, are you kidding me? Like, there's other layers to that that we could get into. But just the stupidity on the surface. And, you know, he's lecturing Dan Connolly about how, you know, this is so out of touch to ask a question like that on MLK Day when we're making this donation and, you know, you're not in touch with the people and what they want in this city. Goes on to talk about how he's lived, you know, not just in Maryland, but in Baltimore City his entire life. That's interesting because on the lawsuit, it lists your hometown, the place you live, as Nashville, Tennessee, where John spends most of his time and is the one place people are worried about him moving the Orioles to because that's basically where he lives. You don't really live in Maryland at this point. He's basically in Nashville. And you're going to say, I've lived in Baltimore City my whole life. And you, as the billionaire child of a billionaire, Peter Angelos, who was the one who actually made the money for the family. And again, my listeners, you know, 
I do not like billionaires. But if you're going to list out the 30 MLB owners, you know, all worth $500 million plus, and list out how they made their money, Orioles' ownership and the Angelos' are probably number one in terms of being the least problematic owners, at least in terms of how they made their money. I mean, Peter Angelos got all his money from a giant class action lawsuit representing workers who were many killed, many gotten sick because of exposure to asbestos that was basically hidden from them. And he got a lot of money from that lawsuit. So maybe he was as much a man of the people as a billionaire baseball owner could be. I'm still not going to say he's a good person, but he's, he's, He's better than a lot of other owners and how they made their money in Major League Baseball. But the thing is, that was Peter Angelos. And Louis Angelos, he has the bar, has his law degree. He's basically running the law firm at this point. That's a lot of the reason why this lawsuit came up. John Angelos, which came up in the lawsuit and in the court documents, didn't even pass the bar exam. So he's not at all the one who in any way helped his dad make that money for the family, just a trust fund baby at this point, who is getting mad at questions about the Orioles when the only reason you're known is for being the front-facing owner of the Orioles right now. He doesn't even have that previous life of, oh, I made all this money doing this, then I bought a baseball team. People knew me before, then I bought a baseball team. No, people knew your dad before, and your dad bought a baseball team, and then he got sick and gave it over to you and your brother. And now you're trying to fight all the control of it after doing absolutely nothing. And then you're going to sit up there after doing absolutely nothing, spending no money this offseason, having a team make one of the greatest jumps in baseball history, plus 31 wins, and spend nothing in free agency, and instead fight with your family about how much of this team you own would you have earned none of. And then you're going to get a perfectly reasonable question. I get maybe it's not the perfect place to ask those questions that Connolly and other reporters asked about the lease and, you know, about the future of the team and ownership. I get that. It was great, the donation that he made. It's awesome. $5 million, that's going to help so many kids in Baltimore go to college. That is fantastic. But also, you could have given a little more than $5 million. But still, amazing stuff that they did there. But when you're showing your face for the first time since the lawsuit that everyone knows about, that is questioning the future ownership of this team, when you're showing your face for just the second time in four years, and you've okayed the ability for the media to ask questions, what do you think they're going to ask about? Like, get a clue, John Angelos. Get a clue. He had no clue, apparently. And that's where I come back to, is he just an idiot? Or is he just think he's so far above everyone else, like many billionaires do, that he's just untouchable? Either way, get him out of my baseball team. This family is becoming toxic for this organization. And it also comes to the point where, and this is a whole other topic about how mad are you going to be at Mike Elias when this is his boss? I think that's kind of fair to maybe ease up on Mike Elias a little bit. Because this guy's a doofus. And all of this... I feel like doesn't even address fully the point that not only is he not answering the question, but he's saying it's not appropriate for those questions because it's MLK Day. Are you kidding me? You scheduled the press conference for Martin Luther King Day. And hey, if you're going to say it's inappropriate, that's fine. But in that sense, you have to make yourself available other times. Then you can make that argument. But if you're never showing your face, People are going to ask that question no matter what day this press conference is on. And then he goes on and on to tell Dan Connolly, you can come back next week. We'll open the books. Meet me on the third floor. We'll look at the financials. There is no way that's happening. And I hope that people at the Sun and at the Athletic and everyone who covers the Orioles try to hold the O's accountable for that sentence that John Angelo said. And next week they come back to the warehouse and say, all right, we're ready to see the books. There is no way they are opening the books. So just a bold face lie from John Angelos. We'll see if he gets caught up in that one or not. Just the ridiculousness of this. And I still didn't even address the lease question as much. You got two weeks. If you were going to sign the lease, you would have signed the lease already. 
listen, if he doesn't sign it, the O's can still stay in Baltimore. Because again, they're still signed through December 31st. They would still have, you know, the next 11 months to still reach a new agreement. Maybe they don't like the terms of the current five-year extension. They want to reach a new agreement. That's fine. But this seems like a pretty easy way to at least ease fans' concerns. And then you can still negotiate a new one for the 5, 10, 15 years after that. But you want to avoid that question too and never show your face again. We're not going to see John Angelos for the next six months after this. I guess I should have allotted 30 minutes for this question I asked myself. But in the end, you're invoking that Dr. King wouldn't have wanted you to talk about the thing you're famous for and the ballpark that you're basically sitting in as you're answering these questions, talk about your team's relationship with the city. Reporters are asking you about how that relationship could change because you might not be the owner or you're maybe not keeping the team in Baltimore. And then you're going to have a response like that. Get this guy as far away from my baseball team as physically possible. But I've got six more mailbag questions to get to. A little bit lighter topics we're going to get to coming up next. Talking a bit about long-term contracts in Major League Baseball, Anthony Santander's position, and the Orioles in the international market. But first, this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is brought to you by BetOnline.net, which is your number one source for sports betting info, stats, news, and analysis here in January. Now, NFL Divisional Weekend coming up. I am still heartbroken and disappointed by the way the Ravens lost to the Bengals. Fortunately, no more Ravens until the fall. Hopefully, Lamar Jackson is back. But still on the football side, you got the divisional round coming up, some great games. And you can get all the odds and all the lines, everything you need at betonline.net. And plus, I mean, there's college basketball, the NBA, and the NHL going on as well. And you can get all the lines for everything at Bet Online. And if you love sports podcasts, which I hope you do, if you're listening to this one, you can find those at Bet Online as well. They're always the fastest and easiest way to get your betting info. So head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more at Bet Online, where the game starts. So we're back here on a mailbag episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast, Mailbag Wednesday. First question that came from myself to myself talking about John Angelos and Basically how the only person that likes John Angelos in Baltimore right now, I think might be Greg Roman because legitimately Greg Roman was only the most hated man in Baltimore for about 12 hours until John Angelos took over that role on Monday morning. But besides that, it feels like he has united all of Baltimore against him after those comments Monday. We'll obviously keep you updated on what happens in that situation. And if he really does, he won't open the books to the beat writers next week. But let's jump back into the mailbag. Our second question of the day comes from Matt via email who asks, do you see Major League Baseball stepping in to shut down these super long-term contracts that we've seen handed out over the past few years and specifically this offseason in free agency? Now, this is a good question from Matt. And it's something that's been chatted about across baseball a little bit because we saw some mega contracts. I mean, you're seeing these 10 plus year deals this offseason for guys like Trey Turner and Xander Bogarts. And, you know, even is what Carlos Correa was initially going to get from both the Giants and the Mets before all the medicals didn't pass through. And he ended up with just the six year deal going back to the Twins. But teams were ready to give out those giant years. And you just look at Correa's, for example, you know, like the, the 13 years, 315 million. He's still making a crazy amount. I mean, that's a guaranteed. 300 million plus, but the way the deals are structured, guys are making less and less money per year as the years go on. And by the end of the deal, you know, yeah, they're still making 20 plus million, but they're not making, you know, 35 to 40 million that they're making at the beginning. And I think the point of this question, which also mentioned Ilya Kovalchuk in the NHL, that deal he got with the Devils, which was a 17-year deal, and basically most of it at the end, he was just going to make league minimum every year, and it was a way to kind of avoid the salary cap and and you know work the game in a bit. It's a little different because there is no salary cap in Major League Baseball like there is in the NHL, but it's also a way for the owners to kind of defer money down the road, and we've seen deferred contracts, obviously most famously Bobby Bonilla, but Chris Davis now has one with the Orioles as well. But it's a different way to defer money down the road and have less of a payroll hit year to year 
in the back half of these mega 10, 11, 12, 13 year deals that free agents are getting. And the reason the question comes is that, you know, are these deals making it much easier for the quote unquote big market teams to sign these big free agents? Because you can say, oh, we're guaranteeing you 350 million. And that player, whether it comes in six years or 15 years, is going to get that $350 million. That's how it works in Major League Baseball. You are guaranteed to get that money. But the difference is, if, you know, the argument is a big market team with all this money can dish out $350 million over 15 years and just say, hey, we're going to give you 200 of that million over the first five years. And then over the next 10 years, we're going to space out 150 million. So our hit is a little less when, you know, maybe you're retired after year 11, but we're still paying you, but it's not nearly as much. And I think fans are worried that the small market teams just can't give out a deal like that. Yeah, maybe they can give out a five year, $175 million deal, but they can't commit that far in advance. And my answer to the question is I don't think MLB can step in because. You can't limit the amount of money. And really, this is more about limiting years on contracts because I could see a guy getting a 20-year deal at some point just to kind of spread this money out. But you can't just step in and change it. It has to be collectively bargained. And of course, we you know it's going to be another four to five years until we have another collective bargaining agreement. We know the, the pain we saw going through the, the lockout last offseason to get a new deal. But the other thing is, I don't see this being stopped unless it becomes incredibly anti-player where guys are only being able to sign deals if they're getting these like 20 year deals and they're making like a million dollars a year at the end. But even then they're still getting the guaranteed money. So this still helps the players. The MLB Players Association is not just in sports, but it's pretty much the strongest union in the United States. They are not, I don't think ever going to be okay with a salary cap. Now this wouldn't be a salary cap if you're putting caps on years, but if the owners are trying to put a cap on how many years you can give out, that is going to be seen to the players as a slippery slope to then allow the salary cap. And so what the Players Association is going to do, they're going to shut down that cap on years. And I get where the concern comes from. It's just never going to happen because the union is so strong for good reason. And they're just going to say, we can't give up a year cap because that might move to a salary cap at some point. And you, you understand that logic completely. And so we'll see how out of hand it can get. Right now, I still don't think it's a huge issue. It's not nearly you know, what that NHL contract was. But obviously, you want to keep an eye on how that uh, continues to advance down the road. Next question comes from Josh via email who asks, why is Anthony Santander seen as an outfielder defensively? Should the Orioles move him to more of a first base and DH type? Now, this is a good question. I think it's come up among the fan base multiple times so far this offseason, because Santander did have his worst defensive season with the Orioles in 2022, despite having his best offensive season and really breaking out at the plate and being a middle of the order bat, he was not good in the field. Now, he did have, you know, it, it was a little interesting to see him this year. He had a negative five defensive run saved, according to Fangraphs, in the outfield this year. However, it was kind of interesting because he was actually plus three. He was above average defensively in right field, but he was negative eight in left field. He was one of the worst defensive left fielders in all of baseball when he played out there this year. Now, I don't think he played an inning in left field at Camden Yards this year because of the new dimensions. You know, it made it harder to play left field. So you'd mostly see Austin Hayes out there and then Santander in right. But when the Orioles went on the road and they were in more standard ballparks, Right field then became the tougher position. So mostly on the road, Hayes would play right field and Santander would move back over to left. And he was horrendous when he was in left field in road ballparks. And so it, it makes you think, should he move with the Orioles kind of still having an opening on the roster for a first base slash DH type? Because, you know, Trey Mancini is gone. They're not bringing back a guy like Jesus Aguilar and they don't really have another first baseman on the roster. Now, Santander was working out defensively at first base during this season, kind of after the O's had traded Mancini and before they had signed Aguilar, mostly in the month of August. And Santander did play a little bit of first base defensively early in his minor league career in the Cleveland Guardian system. So he does have a little bit of experience there and I think could do it in an emergency. But I do think he's going to DH 
a good amount, especially on the road. I think he's still fine to play right field at Camden Yards. The shorter right field with the big right field wall. Again, he was positive and defensive runs saved out there, positive and outs above average or right around average there. So I think at the very least, he's solid enough in right field at home that, you know, he could play 70 games at, in right field at Camden Yards this year. And I think the Orioles would be okay. But when they go on the road, and right field becomes tougher or he gets moved to left field on the road. I would like to see him mostly DH and maybe play a little first base. But I think the answer to this question is going to come down to how impactful the other Orioles outfielders can be. Because right now you would probably slot Austin Hayes in left, Cedric Mullins in center, Santander in right, Mount Castle at first base. And then, you know, you'd have... Kyle Stowers is the next big name in the mix. I think the Orioles should add another bat to kind of be kind of a DH type. But if they don't, obviously that opens it up more for Santander. But if you're going to play better defensively, Santander would DH in that scenario and someone else would play the outfield. So it's really going to depend on how good is Austin Hayes this year. Because if Hayes can kind of find the bat we saw in the first half last year, well, he's going to lock down left field and right field on the road. And it's going to be, you know, there's going to be more ability to move around Santander. But if Hayes looks like he did in the second half and you can't play him every day, well, you're going to need to play Santander either in left field or right field just to get more better bats in the lineup. And I think it's also going to depend on, you know, how much can Ryan McKenna or Taryn Vavra or Kyle Stowers kind of try to break out at the plate this season? Because if any of those guys can break out, they can secure more of a regular corner outfield position in the everyday lineup, which can easily move Santander to DH or first base because those guys are better defensively in the outfield than Santander is. Maybe Adam Frazier, who you know is mostly a second baseman, but can also play all three outfield positions. Maybe if he's hitting better, or maybe if you know Jordan Westberg or Joey Ortiz just takes over second base. Maybe you're playing Frazier in the outfield more and Santander go goes to DH or if the first month in AAA, Colton Kowser just forces his way to the big leagues, you're going to play him defensively in the outfield and move Santander to DH. So it's really going to be about, can someone else in that group I mentioned step up offensively? If they can, it's going to make that move easier. If they can't, I think Santander is going to DH more this year than he did last year, but you're just going to have to play him out there if other guys aren't stepping up. But I do think long-term, whether it's in an O's uniform or not, because he's a free agent after 2024, long-term, He's not going to stick in the outfield for much longer. He's a first base or DH type, but I still think he'll play a good amount out there this year, but still less than he did last year. Next question also comes via email. This one from Vincent who asks, after 2023, can we start to critically evaluate Mike Elias and Kobe Perez and their staff when it comes to international signing classes? And this is, a pertinent question because obviously the international signing period opened on Sunday. If you want to go back and check out Monday's episode, broke down the 27 player class that the Orioles brought in and some of their big names like Luis Almeida, $2.3 million signing bonus, the most the Orioles have ever given out to an amateur international free agent. But kind of the point of Vincent's question was, you know, we really haven't seen the fruits of the labor since Mike Elias came in and actually started bringing in players from the international market. At what point do you start to say they're not very good at this? And he did say, you know, should we start saying it after the 2023 season? I want to pump the brakes on that because as I talked about a bit on Monday, even though Mike Elias took over in November of 2018 and for the 2019 signing period, which that year started in July, he could really start technically signing guys. Because remember, the Orioles were philosophically opposed to signing international free agents in the Dan Duquette regime and before they literally never did it. So they were at zero while every other team was building their rosters via this. I mean, we're at the point where almost 30% of big leaguers were international free agents. You got to be involved in that. So when Mike Elias comes in, you could argue, well, it's 2023. If he started doing this in 2019, why aren't we at least seeing guys that are top prospects that are in double A AA or triple A ready to go? Well, as I talked about Monday, Although you're not supposed to, you know, sign guys and recruit guys until the period opens, all of this is done under the table and every team breaks the rules. They are contacting kids two or three years before they become eligible. You're eligible to sign at 16. They're talking to guys at 14 and 13 years old and basically having verbal agreements with them two years out from the signing period opened. So even though the Orioles were 
starting to finally sign guys in 2019, and they did sign 27 players that year. They didn't get anybody in like the top 300 players that were available, probably even more than that, because everybody had already reached verbal agreements and the Orioles were coming in with five months until the signing period opened with everybody who was good reaching verbal agreements. So they got some solid guys in 2019. And I would say, you know, Luis Valdez has made it the furthest, a speedster who stole 71 bases this year, hit 265 between Delmarva and Aberdeen, 22-year-old, starting to move up the rankings. But not much else from the 2019 class has really stuck. Then you go to the 2020 class. It was obviously hurt by the pandemic, but because you make these verbal agreements two years out, the Orioles still couldn't get the best guys. So they got a couple of better guys in 2020 than they did in 2019. The best name right now looks like Frederick Ben Cosme, 20 year old infielder who went from the FCL all the way up to Aberdeen this season, hit 311 this year with an 801 OPS across three levels. Really excited for him. He'll probably start the year with the Ironbirds this year and, and could get to double A this season. So he's really the first name to come through. But again, they didn't have a chance to get any of the best guys. So really the first year the Orioles even had a chance was 2021. But even then, you know, they came in more than two years out from 2021. But you got to remember, the best players were probably verbally agreed to before then, before the two years. And teams were still not really, and guys and trainers and everything, were still not really used to working with the Orioles because they had never done it until now. So the O's did sign two players to a million-dollar signing bonuses. Michael Hernandez has been a little disappointing. And then the catcher, Samuel Basayo, who has actually been the most positive story of any international signing so far. And you'll see Basayo in Delmarva and possibly Aberdeen this year, kind of a power-hitting, left-handed hitting catcher who's got some real promise and could truly be a top-10 Orioles prospect by the end of this year. So he's kind of the first name coming out of that group. But it's still, they really couldn't do it for real until last year's class. And last year, Braylon Tavera was the big name, $1.7 million signing bonus, biggest the Orioles have ever given out. You know, him with a couple other names, Luis Arias as well, are kind of Leandro Arias, I should say, are, are he's got more than a million. They're kind of in that group where you can finally start evaluating guys. And obviously, Luis Almeida in this group is a big, big signing, biggest bonus ever. But you kind of have to wait till the guys in the 2021, two and three classes are in double A before you can really say, is this successful or not? So you're looking at wait until 2024 or even 2025 to really evaluate this because that's how under the table this whole situation happens. And that's how much you have to kind of look back on these guys and really look forward because the O's were just so far behind before Mike Elias got here. We got a couple more mailbag questions to get to here at the end of the pod. Coming up next, we're going to talk about the shift a little bit to finish out the show. So we're back here on a mailbag episode of the Locked on Orioles podcast. Just going to get to a couple more questions here. I was thinking about doing seven questions. We'll just do six on this episode because uh, I yelled at John Angelos for so much at the beginning of the pod. But both of these questions have to do with the shift. And we'll start with a question from David via Twitter who asked, does the shift ban put more value on Jorge Mateo's defense moving forward? And when David asked the question, he mentioned, you know, Mateo coming up in trade rumors this off season. As we know, a couple of weeks ago, Ken Rosenthal writing at the athletic, the teams were calling the Orioles about Jorge Mateo after all the big shortstops had come off the board. And he's certainly someone the Orioles could trade. I don't want them to this off season, but he's certainly someone I could see them dealing and to answer the question, yeah, I, I think the shift ban puts even more value on his defense because, first of all, if he sticks at shortstop, he was already, as the Fielding Bible told him this year, the best defensive shortstop in all of baseball in 2022. Now, the fact that, you know, against big power pull hitting right-handed hitters, the second baseman can't come on his side of the second base bag, he's going to have even more ground to, to make up when he's playing shortstop. That's going to make him more valuable. But the other thing that's going to make Mateo more valuable is if he does move to second base. And I don't know if the Orioles are going to do that right now because he's so good at short. But if you get to a point where, you know, you feel like you have to play Gunnar Henderson at shortstop, he's so good there, but you want to keep Mateo around. And maybe there's a point where you want to move Mateo to second base. He becomes probably the best defensive second baseman in all of baseball because second baseman with the new shift ban are going to be asked to do a lot more because usually you have a shortstop who can come on the other side of the bag against a lefty and help you field these ground balls. 
But now it's all up to the second baseman to get those grounders deep in the hole with those big lefty pool hitters. And so second basemen have to have a lot more range this year than they have had to have in the past. And if Mateo does move over to second because someone like Gunner sticks at short or he's with another team and plays second base, he's going to be so much more valuable there than a previous second baseman would have because you can't shift and because he can get to so many balls in the hole at second base. I think that makes him really, really valuable at that position. And then the other question having to do with the shift comes from Ali Khan also on Twitter who asks, which Orioles hitters will benefit most from the shift ban? I came up with two guys who were really hurt by the shift last year. Number one was Anthony Santander. And as we know, Santander had a great season. 120 WRC plus, leads the Orioles with 33 homers, hit well from the left and right side as a switch hitter. He had his breakout offensive season, but he did not do well against the shift. Santander had just a 35 WRC plus when facing the shift this season. That is, again, that is 65% worse than a league average hitter when he faced the shift this year. And it was a 29 WRC plus specifically when he was hitting left-handed against the shift. So the shift took away a lot of his hits this year. He was so much better when teams were not shifting against him. So you think about how good he was this year. Now tack on the fact that teams can't shift him. Santander could be in line to get even better in 2023. So that's really culprit number one. And the next guy I would say is Ramon Arias. He wasn't shifted nearly as much as some of these other guys, but when he was shifted, just a 45 WRC plus, which means he was 55% worse than league average when he was shifted last year. He had such an up and down offensive season and Arias, it's big for him because although he's gotten better at this, and I've talked about it time and time again, when Arias hits the ball in the air, he is a good hitter. When he doesn't, it's shaky. Arias hits the ball on the ground a lot, and that means the shift is going to affect him even more than your general hitter because he hits so many ground balls, and he was not good against the shift. But one thing he can do is hit the ball in the air more, and the shift won't hurt him as much. But without a shift, even if he does keep hitting it on the ground, we should see Arias' stats tick up a bit in 2023. And, and the last guy I did want to mention on the flip side of this was Ryan Mountcastle. He had the Orioles' best stats against the shift among qualified hitters this year. He had a 103 WRC plus when shifted this year. He was the only Orioles hitter who was above, above league average against the shift. So we'll see how that affects Mount Castle going into 2023. But that'll do it for today's mailbag episode. Thank you so much for getting in your questions. If you submitted a mailbag question and it was not answered on today's episode. Again, I did get to a little less questions than usual. I will get to them on a future mailbag episode and kind of, unless there's big Orioles news looking at right now, doing another mailbag on Friday, getting to those questions and finishing off the week. If you would like to submit a mailbag question for a future mailbag episode, you can email us at locked on Orioles at gmail.com. You can tweet to the show at Locked on Orioles on Twitter. The DMs are open as well for those mailbag questions. You can drop a mailbag question in the YouTube comments. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe to the Locked on Orioles YouTube page. And if you're listening on Apple Podcasts and iTunes, make sure to give a five-star rating and a review to the show. And in that review section, you can leave your mailbag question and it will be answered on a future mailbag show, which it looks like I'll get to on Friday when I'm back here to finish up the week here on the pod. But until then... I'm Connor Newcomb, and this has been the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.